Hey everyone, so I have a special guest with me today and I'm actually quite excited about it. I've been looking forward to speaking to her. She's known on the internet as Daisy Strongen and she has a really inspirational story. So Daisy transitioned and later came to regret that decision, detransitioned and went on to have a family. So it's kind of an amazing story. Uh, Daisy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I'm I'm really thrilled because yours is, is a unique story, but I think that we're going to have more stories like yours uh, in the future because this is this is just such a very common issue now. Like, I mean, over the past ten years or so, this just emerged as this massive industry. Uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, when did you first start thinking that you were male? Sure. So yeah, I was. Um, well, I have. I had kind of started saying things like about wanting to be a boy from a very young age, like I would say, I remember being like six or seven years old and saying things like I'm part boy and just, um, you know, I had mostly guy friends. I didn't really um, feel like I fit in with the other girls as much, um, but I didn't start thinking about transgenderism until much, much later. I was uh, around 14 years old and I, was very active on a website called Tumblr, which was pretty yeah. big at the time in like 2013. And I was obsessed with it. I spent so much time on it. Um, and originally I wasn't like seeking out the gender stuff, but I was, you know, in a bunch of different fandoms and there, I guess was a little bit of intersection there and it kind of just came up and I sort of read about these like made up gender identities where it's like, oh, if you, you know, you, you can have a gender identity that's something in between male and female. You can be gender queer, or you can be gender fluid and all these like different made up identities. And I remember being 14 and thinking, oh, that honestly, I relate to that a lot. Like, I don't really feel like, I don't feel like a girl. Like I, wouldn't be, I don't think I would have been able to describe to you exactly what that meant yeah. to me or what I meant by that, but I think I am something in between. And at first, you know, it's just like something that I resonated with privately. It was kind of just a personality trait really, but very quickly as I um, became more involved in this discourse, I started looking into like female to male transitions and hormone therapy and top surgery, so-called. And sort of as I was looking into that, I was exposed to the narrative of, you know, if you have gender dysphoria, then you have to transition. Otherwise, you'll commit suicide, uh, which sounds really extreme. But that's put it a I lot. Mean, yeah. Well, that's like everywhere. And that's only, you know, they've only begun become more persistent that that's the case. And hearing that as a depressed, like 16 year old at this point, right. um, you know, I had struggled with like suicidal ideation before. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, wow. I was having a hard time emotionally and I was looking for um, an antidote to my pain. I, it seemed to my, internal experience seemed to line up with the narrative. You know, I've been saying these things since I was a little kid. I like to cross dress all the time in private. And so I basically just determined after a lot of thought, because it's not something, you know, even when I, even though I was 16, it's still, I still knew yeah. it was a big decision, but I basically determined that I was transgender and that I was going, I needed to come out and change my pronouns and start going through this radical transformative process. And I quickly kind of became very excited about it. Like right after I came out, you know, at first I was kind of like, okay, you know, call me he, that would be great. But if you don't, if you call me she, that's still okay. But very quickly I kind of was like, I became very indoctrinated by it and right. it sort of became my whole focus for a while. Were you pushed um, to be more aggressive about that by the trans movement, trans friends, that kind of thing? Well, yeah, I mean, 
I wouldn't say I was pushed by them, but everyone else was very aggressive okay. about it. And just saying, you know, talking about their own experiences and how like this is so important. And so it became very important to me. And I actually, you know, the first year or so I was in high school, I was a senior. I was a, at the end of my junior year when I came out and then I was a senior. Uh, when I was like, you know, I, I had my whole senior year, I was living as a trans trans boy. Yeah. Um, and I had I like gained a lot of friends like in real life who were also like uh, trans or non-binary or, yeah. you know, LGBT in some way. And we all supported each other. And at first it was like really great. I felt like I could express a part of myself that I couldn't really express before. And since I had a positive experience with it at first, I thought, wow, like this, this really is life saving. Like this really is like true. You know, it is like, I just felt more and more validated. And I'm not surprised. Just... I mean, you, you went from a situation of being, uh, as you described it, depressed to suddenly be surrounded by all these different supportive friends and like having a community like that's, that's huge. Yeah. It's huge for anyone, yeah. especially someone like in their in their late teens when it's just a difficult time for anyone anywhere. Yeah. And I wasn't like super popular or like it wasn't very easy for me to make friends before. And now that I had like this, I had never had like a group of friends before, you know, like. Yeah a solid friend group. And now that I had that, it was, um, it felt great. And I felt like it was boosting my confidence even. Um, so that was the first year of being out as trans. When you were there, um, you know, sort of like first beginning to move into this, what, what do you think the main influences were? You mentioned Tumblr and you're not the first person to mention that Tumblr was like sort of the main, um, I guess, pull or the main yeah. exposure to it. Like I've heard that so many times. Were there any like real life influences, uh, you know, um, who were also pushing or was it like the internet that, that really built you in? Well, it was mainly the internet, uh, Tumblr and also YouTube and just, you know, watching like trans YouTubers. Um, but there was one, I knew one person who went to my school and I went to this really big public school and this was in like 20, you know, I went to high school 2012 to 2016. So yeah. the trans thing was sort of in its infancy, like what yeah. it is today, it was in its infancy back then. And I knew one girl who I don't know if she like identified as trans at the time, but she was very butch. She had short hair. She looked like a boy, but yeah. I could still tell she was a girl. And I, she was like a year older than me. So we like, we weren't friends, but I always noticed her. And I was kind of like that. I want to, I want to do that. Like, I want to be able to dress like that and look like that. And, um, it was also, there was another layer of confusion too, because I had this desire to cross dress that mm -hmm. I don't really know where it comes from. Like I just wanted to look like a boy. Um, but every girl that I knew of that look, that wanted to dress like a boy was a lesbian and I wasn't a lesbian. I knew that I was attracted to boys. So okay. I was kind of like, well, then why do I feel this way? Oh, it must be because I'm trans because, you know, gender is separate from sexuality and, you know, the doctrine of the trans sure. movement just lined up with that. So there was one person that I knew of, like I didn't even know them personally. Um, but then later that person transitioned and then we became friends. And then actually that person detransitioned too. And okay. so, yeah. Um, to go. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was mostly online though, to answer your question. Gotcha. And when you first like started to transition, um, or even just like, I guess you use the phrase come out, but you know, publicly present uh, as mm -hmm. a male, uh, what would the reaction like from your like parents, your family? Uh, from my family, my immediate family, they were kind of like, what is going on? <laughs> like, what sure. are you doing? I tried desperately to explain it to them because I really wanted them to understand me, but they were just like, I don't think this is you. Like, you're really not very masculine. Like, you're <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. Um, and so they were confused by it. And I think my extended family, they didn't really like talk to me about it, but they were probably confused by it as well and had their own opinions. Um, but again, like socially, my friends and just like people at school, even people at school that I didn't know that well, because I came out on Instagram. Okay. Um, I was like, I'm trans. I want to go by the name Oliver. And it was this, you know, it was supposed to be this kind of like inspiring romantic thing. Yeah. And um, I remember the next day, some people coming up to me and being like, hey, I really admire you for coming out. Um, so again, the social validation was there. Sure. Would your would your family, would they use the, the pronouns and the the new name and all of that, or would they refuse to? Uh... No, they they didn't want to use my preferred pronouns or my new name. Um, they didn't start doing that until like right before I detransitioned, because I think <laughs> at that point they had given up. Gotcha. So. Gotcha. Um, and w were there any? Okay, so they were like, I guess you could say, pushing back somewhat, in that they weren't, you well, know. Yeah. Okay. Especially as I especially as I went into the, you know, seeking testosterone and surgeries, they became progressively horrified by it. Sorry, I, I hear my my daughter. Go ahead. Has Go ahead. Up. Um, just give me one second. Mm -hmm. uh, would you describe your family as being Christian then? Um, my mom is Christian. My dad is agnostic. Okay. They're both more conservative, though. Gotcha. And how about in like the rest of society? So you got some pushback from your family. You got some congratulations from friends about your bravery, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, was any, anybody else just seem particularly uh, aggressive or friendly? What was it like for you? Um, pretty much the only real pushback I got was from my immediate family. Okay. So that would be my parents, my brother, and my uh, my grandmother were because they knew me the best so they knew they just knew that this wasn't right not i mean i think they were of the opinion that it wasn't right in general but it definitely wasn't right for me but i pretty much just wrote them off as being transphobic transphobic sure um and then you started the testosterone when you were 18 yeah, I was I was eighteen, okay. barely an adult. So right, I, yeah, I know. No prefrontal cortex hasn't developed, um, but yeah. at that point, uh, what was that like? You started the drugs first, I presume, then the top surgery later. Is that correct? Yeah. So I basically I called a um, clinic in in downtown Chicago, um, and they got me an appointment. And so I just did that over the phone and I was like, oh, well, that's exciting. You know, maybe, maybe I'll get hormones soon. Uh, or maybe, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to need like therapy or people, you know, like a therapist or a psychiatrist to sign off on it. I thought it was going to be like a really difficult process. Mm -hmm. And then the day came for my appointment and um, they... They did tell me, like, here are the things that are going to change. Your voice is going to change, and you might get hairier. You'll have, like, more muscle growth. You might have, you know, an increased risk of, like, heart-related problems, which, you know, is true. I, I appreciate them, like, being honest with that. Um, and, yeah, I just got my hormones that day. I, like, did my first shot there. They wow. taught me, like, how to do it because it's self-administered injections so you know it's really important that you do that right um yeah so yeah but it was really easy it was not like expensive i think i spent like 60 dollars um okay so it's so, really affordable yeah and, it was very and they didn't get you to easy. see anybody to sign off on whether or not you were capable of assenting to that so any sort of psychologist or anything like that no no okay they, they asked me some questions about like how long I had been transitioning and at that point it had been like a year mm -hmm. and I think I looked the part honestly like I sure. looked you know like I was trying to look like a boy 
Um, and so they just, they figured they had no reason to not believe me. And so, yeah. And then I remember walking out and I was so like happy and there was another uh, trans person waiting in the lobby who was like, Congra congratulations. It's like, it's like I've just given birth in a hospital and everyone's like so happy for me. <laughs> it's right. Yeah. How did, it, how did it start to feel then after you started to take the testosterone? Well, uh, when a female takes testosterone, she goes through uh, what 12, 13 year old boys go through. They, she goes through a male puberty essentially. And that is really unnatural, obviously, and very sure. overwhelming physically and emotionally. Um, I became very, uh, a, a, my libido was very high. Um, I'll just say that. Sure. And um, so, you know, that led me to a bunch of like really unhealthy habits, yeah, um, like pornography and things like that. Um, and of course, at that time, I was like, it's normal, you know, like, right. it's totally normal. Like, that's what the culture says. It's like, it's okay to watch porn and masturbate every day. Like, it's totally fine. Um, and I was very angry. Like, my anger manifested in a way that it, it never has for me before, because I felt it was like a physical thing. Like I wanted to. Like your body like, was angry. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, and like punch walls and stuff. Like I just had this urge to just like externalize my anger in a very physical way, and it was very overwhelming. Um, and yeah, I had never experienced that before. And I just had I had higher energy levels, um, and. I was also prescribed antidepressants kind of around the same time. So I I didn't even know if like what was going on with me was you know, like I knew that the the anger and the libido was because of the testosterone, but I was also having like almost manic episodes where I just started engaging in like really like I had intense mood swings and I just started engaging kind of like really impulsive dangerous behavior right. and um yeah, I remember like my I was seeing a therapist at that time and she was like, you're scaring me like you are literally you seem like you're going through a manic episode right now. And my mom noticed the same thing. And um, yeah, it was just a really like weird time for me psychologically. Imagine. I mean, even as a woman, you have just like natural mood alterations as a result of her estrogen, you know, changing you know, throughout yeah. the month. And so then you add testosterone into this. It's just a very weird, like you said, unnatural mix. It's like, you, oh, yeah. you just expect, like, like, it's difficult for me to, to know what you experienced because I just haven't experienced it. So it's really fascinating to listen to you. But at the same time, like you could, oh, almost anyone could predict that it would result in some volatility. Like, how could it possibly not, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was so, like, I was very, disconnected from my body throughout this entire process. Um, like, I was aware of the changes that were happening, but not, I didn't really know what it was doing internally. I was just kind of paying attention to how I felt. Sure. Uh, but yeah, like I, I had, I didn't really feel connected to my body. I was kind of dissociating from it because it became like this really problematized thing because it's female. My body's female. My gender identity is male. There's this like discordance there sure. that, yeah. yeah. So I started to antagonize my body really. Do you think uh, in retrospect, I'm just, just an opinion here, that what you experienced with the rages and all of that kind of ties into the concept that's described on the internet as trans rage, you know, so just with these like shootings and this kind of stuff, or just an increase in aggression by trans people, or at least so it seems per capita. Yeah, I mean, I think it it definitely has to do with the test the, with testosterone, just generally. But, you know, I also think that it's like I I see more and more that uh, gender ideology is a religious idea, like, and people get very just fired up about it because it's so life and death to them, and it's just so 
important and elevated and it's just it's 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 very cult like and i think that yeah. psychologically changes people as well yeah yeah definitely that makes sense and then after that so how long were you on the testosterone before you thought about the top surgery um well i think once i was on testosterone i knew that i eventually okay. wanted to have top surgery because i was uh wearing a binder every day so i was basically like smushing down my breasts right. every day so that i looked flat so that i could pass passing was really important to me and before i was on testosterone i didn't pass at all because i still looked like you know i sounded very female and yeah um, and of course i was operating under the assumption that i was going to be trans for the rest of my life i'm not going to bind yeah. for the rest of my life um so I have to get top surgery so that I can, you know, like go swimming shirtless and do all of these like things that the trans community sees as like almost like um, almost like rites, like li like rituals, right, I guess. Yeah. Um, like there was this whole idea of like this like romanticized idea of like being on the beach for the first time shirtless as a trans guy and how freeing that feels and you know the idea of just being flat without having to like wear this thing that restricts my breathing it's like obviously i'm gonna eventually need to do that gotcha. um so i didn't i don't know when I, I probably started like looking for a surgeon and seeking it out in probably 2017 um so just like two years after i came out and then um I had several like appointments leading up to it. And for the surgery, I, I did need to have a psychiatrist sign off on it. That wasn't hard to do. Um, and I think I needed two letters. I needed one for my general doctor who like doesn't know me at all. Right. And, and my psychiatrist really doesn't know me at all either. She just prescribes me pills. I just go in and say sure. like, I'm anxious. I can't focus. And Looks she's like, like I you're, just do. And yeah. you're so lost. Oh, you're, you have gender dysphoria. Okay. I'll, I'll sign off this letter for you. Right. Um, so yeah. Do you think they're afraid not to though? Like the, the social environment right now is such that if they refuse to, to, to sign off, that they'll get all kinds yeah. of different, you know, uh, pressure yeah. from the industry, even itself, the medical industry. Yeah, I think it's probably pr a mixture of pressure and just ignorance. Right. Because um, there weren't really, there weren't that many like detransitioners at this time. Yeah. Um, and so people just kind of accepted the narrative that like, oh, gender dysphoria, the, there's a treatment for that and it's gender transition and, you know, okay, yeah, whatever. Like, I think it was probably a mixture of ignorance, apathy, and pressure to go along with the culture yeah was was there fast forwarding a, a little bit here was there a a huge moment um in which you suddenly regretted your decisions up to that point or was it like a gradual questioning it was definitely gradual but there were a few moments that really kind of made me uh worried <laughs> that what i had done was wrong okay. one of those was I was probably like, I didn't have any moments like that before top surgery. Top surgery was like, it was right in the middle of that, the five years that I was trans. So it was kind of almost like the climax. Yeah. Um, and then after that, I didn't want to do anything else. So um, I was just left with what I had done. And so one moment was, oh my God. One moment was when I was, uh, I was probably like 21 and I was starting to think about like, if I wanted kids, how would I go about having them? And I always kind of thought like maybe surrogacy. Mm -hmm. Now I'm against surrogacy, like all, <laughs> right. I, um, but in that but, mindset. Yeah. 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 So Lila, no, don't look at the camera. <laughs> I was just kind of like, how much does surrogacy cost, first of all? Mm -hmm. And because I was just totally ignorant of it. Mm -hmm. um, it And it costs like $90,000, like at least. Right. And 
I was like, oh, wow, that's um, like it should have been obvious to me that that would be expensive. But I didn't I just didn't know how expensive it was. And then that's when, you know, I was thinking about my options. I was like, okay, I I could go go down the route of adoption, um, but I just don't even know if I'm like a good enough person. Like, I think I (laughs) and then I remembered like I or I could get pregnant or I could marry a man and get pregnant and yeah, I guess I could like continue pretending to be a guy because some people do that. Mm-hmm. Like, I have no idea how, but right when you're some... actively carrying a child. Yeah, like like trans transgender females who get pregnant, go through pregnancy, give birth, and still identify as men. I I just knew that like I was never going to be able to like really comfortably be like at that level of delusion. Sure. Um, and so I, that was one moment I didn't, obviously I didn't just decide like right then and there that I was going to detransition, but that was definitely a but You have like a biological urge that, that sort of kicked in. Yeah. That yeah. It, you know, cause, cause when I made this decision as a 17 year old, like I, I, I wasn't thinking about having kids at sure. all. Like it was probably something like, you know, I would have said like, yeah, maybe when I'm 35, <laughs> like yeah. I'll figure out a way to have a child, but it just like didn't matter to me. And breastfeeding certainly didn't matter to me either. Yeah. Um, so that was a hard moment when I look, when I researched that because sure. I was like, well, yeah, like I want to have my own kid, but now I won't be able to breastfeed them. Like, even if I detransition, like, I don't know how. So I just kind of stopped thinking about it and kind of left it at that. It was, for a while, it was something that I really just tried to suppress the yeah. feelings of regret because it's like, I've done so much. Right, and it's I like have... there's no going back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that that was one moment. And then another, you know, there were just some times where... I was just like alone with with my thoughts and I would just kind of look at my chest and look at like my body basically and realize that like, man, you know, I didn't really have that, like I didn't feel super insecure about my body. I mean, I did because every young woman does, but now (laughs) I feel extremely insecure about it because I'm... you know, supposed to be a 21 year old man. And I don't look, I don't look like a 21 year old man at all. Like I'm still super skinny and like curvy and, you know, I don't have any like hair. Like I, I just look off. Like I don't even quite look like a young boy. I, I don't like, I look like something else. And so it's like, well, this was supposed to help my body dysmorphia and not make it worse. Sure. So that was a big red flag as well. Okay, so so there there were the two like main factors, and then at some point you you decided to make the leap. What what changed? Um, so it was during the COVID lockdown mm-hmm. in like May of 2020. Okay. And obviously, I was spending a lot of time alone. Um, and just, I didn't have the, like the external validation and like the, the high from that really had worn off Mm -hmm. a long time ago at that point. Um, and I was just really kind of, it was a heavy burden on my consciousness at this point. I probably started like feeling feelings akin to regret in like 2019 but i was just like trying to say like no 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 no. like you signed up for this you have to stick with it um and just ride this out and you'll be fine like just keep being a guy (laughs) um but then i think in 2020 like there was a day where i it was time for me to take my weekly testosterone shot and i was like I do not want to do this anymore. Like, I don't want to further, I don't want to further jeopardize my fertility. Mm -hmm. I don't, like, I just don't think this is healthy. I don't, 
I just had decided at that point, like, I don't want to take another testosterone shot. And I think um, at that point, I knew that stopping testosterone meant detransitioning. Um, so, yeah, there was that was the moment I think I decided officially that I was going to detransition. Um, it's, a, it's a really brave move because you're just you're giving up on I mean on so much like like you said you 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 invested a lot into this you know and, and yeah. obviously even though that's wrong it's like you, a person's mind gets latched onto those things um yeah. and then you surround yourself in a social circle that encourages it as well so that had to have just been a really isolating and thus brave decision I mean really yeah it's, it's and commendable. I had started sort of like sorry oh yeah you're fine I started kind of like watching other detransitioners and feeling like, oh, I relate to their feelings a lot too. Mm -hmm. um, and it was sort of, there were a few more uh, women who were kind of my age who were talking about, you know, it had similar timelines. So I was like, okay, well, it's not like I'll be the only person in the world that'll have this experience. Um, yeah, I'll have to go through my life with a deep voice and no breasts, but honestly, it's probably just better to live in reality. And I felt very relieved when I started living in reality again. Had, um, had you by that point sort of stopped feeling as if you were male? Had those feelings just mostly gone away? Um... I don't know. Um, I being Ollie at that point was my comfort zone. Okay. The idea of like starting to dress feminine again and presenting that way was very uncomfortable at first. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's also like I had already like lived out this fantasy for five years, twenty four seven. You know, it's like. Okay, I I I don't think I need to do this anymore. Like I've I've indulged the fantasy. I've recognized that it is a fantasy and right. it's not a reality. It's not like, you know, I don't believe that I have a gendered soul anymore. And the trans movement is starting to do starting to. It's I'm starting to see how it's going really off the rails. Yeah. Um I don't agree with it. <laughs> like, I don't agree with the ideology. So how can I continue to live it out? You know, like I was doing it passively. I wasn't like, you know, a proud trans activist at this point anymore. I was just kind of like not detransitioning, basically. Right. You're, just, you're just living in a certain way. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, but it does sound like there was a, I mean, obviously there are multiple mind shifts there, but the one that kind of like is interesting to me is that, you know, from 18 when you were very much feeling like you you were a guy on the inside, um, and then you fast forward to this point and you can, you've can you sort of delineated the idea that it's a fantasy from the reality. And I think that, you know, there, there have been these studies that are not really cited very much anymore, but that show that so many people just simply grow out of this if they're just kind of left alone and that's the thing yeah. and I, I wonder do you think that would be the case with you if you had not you know taken the steps or what do you think yeah 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 that was another that was another moment if you will where i it kind of gave me pause it was the realization that i probably would have been able to work through the gender dysphoria just on my own without hormones and top surgery and all that like i probably would have survived um i actually was like no i definitely would have survived um so right because i mean there are plenty of women i mean maybe they weren't in your circle necessarily but there are plenty of women who dress in more masculine ways i mean frankly i think most women now in the modern world sort of dress somewhat you know, in, in a neutral way, you know, the way that men dress and the way that women dress on an everyday um, basis is not as differentiated as it once was. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so and like now it's like now it's like I don't, you know, I can do both if I like it's not 
it's not that deep for me anymore. <laughs> like if sure. I want to wear pants, I'll wear pants. If I want to wear a dress, I'll wear a dress. It it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> right. So it you seems know? like if you'd have gone through if you had gone through the same thing like twenty years earlier, you might have gone through a phase of like wearing really boyish clothes for yeah. I don't know several and I years did when I was a kid. Right, and then perhaps just simply grown past it. Yeah, because I wouldn't. I would. No one would have told me like, oh, this means you're a boy. Exactly. Oh, this means you're in the wrong body. Like, that's just not a good idea to introduce to an adolescent ever. No, no, it's 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 dangerous. I think it's honestly, I just think it's the evil, you know, to say to the the confused kid, as we're all confused children when we're children, that's part of like being a child, you know, um, actually, maybe you're this other thing on the inside and just kind of just confuse um, everything yeah. while they're in this state of hormonal imbalance yeah. and immature development and everything else. It's yeah. Project. And I remember I was always trying to like diagnose myself when I was in like middle school, early high school. Um, I was like, maybe I have, maybe I have like autism. Maybe I have a uh, <laughs> borderline personality disorder or uh, like, you know, multiple personality. Like I was, I was like trying to diagnose, like trying to figure out what was wrong with me. I wanted like a label that I could sort of, sure. um, almost blame my behavior on, um, or like have it like, just, I wanted to understand myself and why I was the way that I was because everyone else, I, I had this idea that everyone else was normal. And I just kind of felt like, I don't know, like a freak, like there was something wrong with me. Like I didn't know, I wasn't very good at like socializing with people. People didn't, sure like me all that much people you know i was like i feel like i'm interesting and cool but no one else <laughs> seems to <laughs> on the so. internet though you can always find somebody who who seems as quirky as you matches your degree yeah. of quirky that's why i spend so much time on the exactly. internet. exactly i think it happens to so many young people that way they can't find just the right group that you know they feel at home with and therefore they find it on the internet and that just goes in a really dark destructive um direction yeah, yeah it feels really good and innocent at first like I, you know, when I was learning about all the gender queer stuff, like yeah. there wasn't, there didn't seem to be anything nefarious about it. Cause you know, I wasn't groomed by adults. I think the content that I was consuming was from other like girls my age who were actually just like going through the same thing. And, you know, that's not a new phenomenon uh, of, you know, women, young women sort of feeding into each other's pain Sure. Community. I mean, you saw that well, like things like the emo movement in which like self harm was spread around and encouraged and that kind of thing. That was like a big yeah. part of it. I remember that. I, I, I cut myself when I was a teenager because I saw it online. Right. <laughs> exactly. I was like, and so that's the thing. It's, it's one of those things where, where you think it's a very new and novel idea. And then you remember back at these different, like really frankly, dark chapters that we've had not that far back in history. And yeah, and it's what happens. People, people at that age are just so vulnerable to the suggestion and to the to the desire for community. So when that's offered to them, it's like they just really do just sort of like really latch on uh, yeah. to, the, to that. Yeah. You you uh, you converted to the Catholic faith, so did I a couple of years ago. So I don't know if I'm mm -hmm. saying welcome, if you're saying welcome. Um, but how did how did or did it overlap with your detransitioning? It very much overlapped with my detransition. Um, well, so I was raised Christian. I, I mentioned my mom was Christian. Sure. Um, we we went to a non-denominational Protestant church, and um, I had I had a very like strong faith when I was uh, like in probably when I was like eleven. Um, like seventh grade, I remember I, I just had a very kind of like childlike faith and I knew that Jesus died for me and that he loved me. And then I was, yeah. that was all I knew. Um, and that was enough for me. But then I basically, I learned about the, the doctrine of like sin and hell and, you know, like anyone who doesn't believe in Jesus, like goes to hell. And I was like, well, that's awful. Uh, like that means my dad's going to hell and all, and, and all these other people who don't believe the same way. And that just really kind of turned me off to it. And 
I decided like, you know, this doesn't really make any sense. Um, so I just fell away from it. Um, and was kind of anti-Christian mm -hmm. all throughout high school. And then while I was in the middle of my transition, actually, I started listening to Jordan Peterson and he talks a lot about God. Yeah. And I found what he said about God, it was articulated in a way that was very compelling to me. He wasn't preachy at all because he's not even Christian. But I like, know, it's, it's, it's fascinating just how many people he, he pulls into the faith. Yeah, yeah. And um, so this is in like 2017. This is a long time ago. But he kind of got me thinking and almost obsessing over the question of like, okay, wait, like, what do I actually believe about God? You know, I've been sort of agnostic and not thinking about it and not really caring whether or not God is real, but I should care about this question. Um, but I just have no idea. Like I have, I have no idea how I should answer it or what I should do, or if God is real, like which God is real. So I was like, I just kind of became interested in going to church and not becoming a member of a church or actually practicing because I felt like me being trans, like, I don't know if that's going to work. Sure. Um, so I basically was just kind of going to church, like a different church every week, like a different Protestant church every week and just kind of being like, oh, you know, how do I feel about this one? How do I feel about this one? What did I think of their worship service and the way that they, you know, preach or whatever? Right. Or, oh, this this guy said something bad about gay people. I don't want to go back there like I felt uncomfortable. Or, oh, this progressive church is um, different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, so I just kind of was going to different churches. I was like, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I, I like this. I find this interesting. And, um, but still the question was nagging me. I was like, I can't, I don't know if I'll ever be comfortable having a decisive answer on it. And this is really bugging me because everyone has a different opinion. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's like a million different denominations and I don't know which one is right. Um, so then when I detransitioned in 2020, it felt like that that barrier that was between God and I was no longer there. And because that really was the reason why I wasn't going deeper into it. Because I was like, I just, I came, I came to realize, like, I, I was made female, right? I, that wasn't up to me, that was never up to me. And it's not up to me now, something, somebody made me this way, like there's, this was a sovereign decision. And it's like, I should try to live out like who God called me to be as a woman. I can't do that saying that I'm a man. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I basically like I detransitioned and, you know, I just like opened my heart up to, to Jesus basically. Um, and was like, okay, I'm going to start reading scripture I'm going to try to read the whole Bible. I'm going to start praying and just like see what happens. And it was a very like profound experience. And I learned a lot and I started to develop a real like personal relationship with Jesus and uh, started like going to church, like one church. Mm -hmm. I started going to the church I grew up going to. And yeah, so that was when I converted to Christi back to Christianity but I wasn't thinking about Catholicism at all because I just, I just was so ignorant about it. Sure. And I was like, I wasn't raised that way. So it's like, I couldn't really see myself converting. Um, and then I kind of fell away again for a few months and just really struggled with my prayer life. Cause there was kind of, it was kind of an emotional experience converting back to Christianity sure. and that kind of wore off. And I was like, I have to, I'm, I'm trying to persevere, but like my faith just feels weaker. Um, and I was still struggling with just like the sheer amount of denominations and all of the like Christian discourse. And it's like, 
I feel like no Christian really like, like there's no unity. Like it's, it became very annoying. Um, I was like, I just want to like know what the truth is and I want to know what to do and just, you know, follow that. So I knew nothing about Catholicism. Um, I started, well, the reason why I started going back to church yet again, um, when I, I, I was pregnant with, uh, my son. So this was like two years ago and I wanted to like, I wanted to raise him in church. I still wasn't totally sure where I stood, but I was like, I'm tired of thinking about myself. Um, I, I do think that being a Christian is good and going to church is good. So I'm, I think we should start going to church and we should like get our son baptized. And I chose to go, we, me and my husband chose to go to an Episcopal church because I was like, I want something more liturgical and serious and not so much about me and but but I didn't I was like I don't I'm not Catholic so mm-hmm. Episcopal's kind of like Catholic but it's not actually Catholic like uh, yeah <laughs> and it's also you know it's kind of progressive which I don't love but you know this church wasn't obnoxious about it okay. um and that's when I learned about um the Eucharist mm-hmm. Um, and that's when I started thinking about, okay, well, what's Catholicism then? Um, if this is, you know, this, this, I had never even been to a Catholic mass before, but the Episcopal church was still very different from anything that I'd experienced. And so I was like, okay, well, so I started you know, researching Catholicism was like, what do they believe about the Eucharist? Oh, that it's Jesus? Wait, like actually Jesus? Yeah. Huh. That's, wow. Um, I didn't know, like, I didn't know that. I had no idea. I thought that, you know, non-Catholics weren't able to take the Eucharist because Catholics were just like liked to exclude people. (laughs) It's like, no. And I was like, that's crazy. I had no idea they believed that. So what does the Episcopal Church believe? something kind of muddy and confusing. Okay. Um, why does, you know, why doesn't the Catholic church ordain women? Why in the, the Episcopal church does? Oh, because they just decided that they wanted to, but you know, the Catholic church has 2000 years of history. And that was when I actually considered, that was when I first started, you know, realizing and hearing people say that this is actually the original church yeah. and this is actually the one true church that Jesus Christ himself founded. And, you know, I had always said, like, I want the truth. It make it seems to make sense that I should maybe look into following the church, following the oldest church, following the apostolic church. And, um, I didn't, I didn't really consider orthodoxy. Um, well, I, I, I'm sure I did, but I just felt proximity wise more like close to Catholicism. And I just, I don't know. That's where I was being pulled. I think if God wanted me to convert to Eastern Orthodoxy, he would have found a way to do it. But yeah, so I talked to my husband about it, um, and he he had kind of been echoing the same sentiments of like, you know, I don't think I can be a Protestant. I think if I'm going to be a Christian, I, I want to be a Catholic. He had read a lot of like Catholic authors, so he knew a little he knew a little bit about it. Um, and yeah, well, like we just started going to mass and just didn't stop. And then a few months after going to mass, I uh, just approached a priest and was like, I, I want to convert. How do I do that? Yeah. Um, and so I didn't actually do like a formal RCIA. I, the, the priest that I uh, approached, he, he's, a, he, he's a priest at a traditional Latin mass parish. Okay. 
that was another thing I discovered the traditional Latin mass. And what do you think of it? You no. Know, well, with the Novus Ordo masses, it was like I know more what's going on, yeah. and it does feel different in a sense that this it's not about me. Um, but the traditional Latin mass, it just felt even more so like, oh, this is not about me yeah. at all. Um, and I was just very, like, fascinated by it. It's like, wow, this is the mass, like, that, this is the mass of the ages. Like, this exact, basically exact ritual has been going on for thousands of years, and it's the mass of the saints. And I was just so, I had never, I had never experienced a, like, church service that has such I don't even like to call it service that's the protestant in me saying <laughs> it's like okay. church I understand. Service. but like there there's nothing in protestantism that has such a rich deep history and I began to find it very beautiful yeah. and logical and you know the things that I thought would be keeping me out of it like the the Marian doctrines it's, it just kind of quickly, like, oh, no, like, that makes perfect sense. Like, obviously, the mother of God is not going to be just some random lady, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. obviously, she is set apart. And, like, yeah, you know, some people might say that I'm, like, you know, just easily indoctrinated and believe, you know, I can't think critically. But, yeah, like, there were some things where I'm just kind of, like, yeah, okay, I'll just accept that, you know, like, like, when you convert to Catholicism, mm -hmm. there are some things where it's like, you don't necessarily have to have a perfectly constructed logical explanation of, of everything, like the it's, assumption of marriage. Like, it's not even that, or, it's like, there's just so much there, at least for me, like, again, I, I converted just a couple of years ago, yeah. but it's like, so you, you kind of have to, like, uh, learn the parts that are, I guess, most fundamental, and then... Yeah. After that, when, and when you have this, this understanding of the faith and its starting point, like you were talking about, an apostolic succession, um, then yeah. after a certain point, it's like, okay, you know, I, I assent to what the church teaches because I trust yes. what it claims for itself that it is the church yeah, that Christ exactly. founded. You know, and so that's the that's the I, yeah. I assent on on faith to its authority because of where it gets that authority and because you believe in that yeah. line. And with when with Protest with being a Protestant, like. I felt so I felt such a heavy burden and pressure because you know while I do respect their emphasis on scripture mm -hmm. um it's like you have to be able to determine this on your own yeah. like you have to read the whole bible you have to determine exactly what it means and you better hope that your that your conclusions are right and what every line means uh -huh. yes and that's the thing it's like yeah. you have to read it enough that you understand every passage and correctly and then know that there are all these different denominations that have interpreted it differently hence why they're separate yeah. and somehow assert that you alone know more than anybody else who's who's come before and who's done the same thing and no more than in the case of you know the catholic church all of the different church fathers from the very beginning you know it, it's just kind of when you really think about it in those terms that's when i was like okay yeah i i can't i can't make that determination that that like i alone am the interpreter of scripture you know it just seems kind of right crazy yeah, because it's like why is my interpretation any more valid than anyone else's. Right, exactly. I'm still going to twist this. I'm still <laughs> going to, you know, have temptation to kind of like make it say what I want to say. Exactly. You know? Um, and so ultimately, though, the Eucharist is what really made me stop going to the Episcopal Church and turn to the Catholic Church. Um, because just learning about that doctrine, like, and then reading and really paying attention to John John 6 it's like pretty clear to me that Jesus is not like speaking as a metaphor he's very serious yeah. and people are like what are you talking about that's disgusting he's like no like you like this is my body yeah like you unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you will not enter the kingdom of heaven and it's and it's like, why Why would that be a metaphor? And that's people not, left, you know? There were some of the followers at the time who left, like, this is too much to us. 
a little too much for us. And yeah. he didn't like say, oh, but I meant it metaphorically. Okay, <laughs> you know, and yeah. he had the opportunity right then because people right then were already saying that they were, you know, unwilling to accept this doctrine basically. And they walked away and he did not change the doctrine or change that. I, I don't mean it this way. I just mean it spiritually, you know, that, that's, that's yeah. not the case at all. Yeah. So yeah, that was ultimately to make a long story short, the Eucharist is what, and I know many other people oh, yeah. probably would say the same thing, that that is so unique to the Catholic Church. Um, and like I started going to adoration before I was officially Catholic and just I was approaching my faith in just a very different way, just a, like a brand new mindset that God was introducing me to. And... And it was through his mother because I started praying the rosary every single day, like right away. I remember I wanted to pray the rosary before when I, you know, was um, just, you know, cr evangelical mm -hmm. Christian. I was like, I want to pray the rosary, but I have to say Hail Mary over and over <laughs> again. And I just like know about that. Um, but I loved the idea of like meditated, meditative prayer and meditating on Jesus's life. Yeah. Um, I think one time I like, I tried to pray the rosary, but I had no idea how to do it. So I was just saying the Jesus prayer over and over again, because <laughs> I didn't want to say the Hail Mary. Um, and that was the only time that I did that. But yeah, so I picked up that practice and um, I just, yeah, it, it's been, it's been fantastic. Yeah, it's I, a beautiful I'm so story. You went through that I made that decision. I haven't regretted it for a second. It's been pretty hard um, because I'm just, I'm very sinful and we, we I, are. yeah. And, but the sacrament of confession, I that was also a big deal for me. It's like, that seems like a great idea. <laughs> like that seems like a great thing. And um, just living a sacramental life, like really living out your faith and being able to live it out every day like i will share the past week or so i've started to really make an effort to go to mass every single day like go to daily mass yeah. like i kept coming up with excuses like oh i have two little kids i can't do it my local parish has three different daily mass times oh beautiful and like yeah like there's i don't have an excuse like why wouldn't i want to receive jesus in the eucharist every day so yeah, I'm a daily I've been really making an effort to go to daily mass and it's, yeah, it's been great. I love being Catholic. <laughs> Me too. Uh, so connecting this back with what we've been talking about. Um, so you've, I mean, you, you joined the faith, you found a husband, um, you have two daughters. Is that right? I have a son and son a daughter. daughter. All right. And were you after the, after the um, medical interventions that you received, were you afraid of difficulties conceiving? Because you kind of talked about that a little bit earlier on. Yes. Um, well, yeah. Uh, when I when I was dating my husband, I was not sure if I could have children. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I just didn't know it wasn't something that i spent a lot of time thinking about because i was like that would be so devastating because that would be my fault if that's the case um but we ended up getting pregnant like immediately oh that's awesome <laughs> um yeah i mean that was like that was just astounding to me um that it happened that it happened right away. I was so nervous about, you know, month after month, like not succeeding in conceiving a child and like how, how nervous and scared that would make me. But that was really, uh, that was really amazing, uh, finding out that I was in fact quite fertile. Yeah. Praise God. Uh, yeah. And I knew that like, you know, I, I was never on puberty blockers, thankfully. Um, that's really what jeopardizes fertility. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily hormone replacement therapy on its own. 
I was, however, getting closer to the five-year mark. I was on testosterone for three years and nine months. Okay. And I knew that as my reproductive system started to atrophy, because when you're on testosterone, your reproductive system basically is just not doing anything. Yeah. Like it's not going through the normal cycle. So it starts to atrophy and that that can be very, very painful. And then you need a hysterectomy and then obviously you can't have kids. Um, so that's why I stopped because I wanted to keep my uterus. Um, and so, but still I wasn't sure. Yeah. Like I didn't know what effect the testosterone had. Um, not everyone can say the same and not every detransitioner can say the same. And I never want to sound like I'm like bragging about my life. I know that like fertility is a very sensitive topic for some people. So I, you of know, course, but it is a beautiful story and it's okay to celebrate that. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, the, your kids are gifts. It's okay to, to be very, you know, grateful yeah. for them. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't be apologetic. And about then I that. got pregnant and I, I got pregnant with her. Mm -hmm. Um, nine, nine months after Gabriel was born. Um, and I'm okay with saying their names. Okay. I've said their names before. Um, and so, yeah, like the past two years have just been insane. Like pregnant for nine months, have, you know, not pregnant for nine months, then I'm pregnant for another <laughs> yeah. nine months. And, um, I'm going to probably take some time off. <laughs> for a while because I've got two yeah. kids up too, but like, I just, I just love being a mom. I mean, I didn't think, I didn't think of myself as a very like maternal motherly person before. Um, but just having that come out and just like seeing my life as not necessarily like it's my choice, but like as a vocation, because that's also kind of a Catholic yeah. concept I, you know, what just wasn't familiar with at all. But it's like, no, like, this is a vocation. This is your, this is how you glorify God with your life is from, is by being the, the best mother and wife that you can be and try to reflect Christ in your life as a wife and mother. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't have to say that it's hard. Everybody knows that it's hard, but it's so good like it's the best thing that i've ever done and it just brings me it just brings me so much joy and i any all of the anxieties that i have and the frustration and the impatience that i experience i can i can offer it up and i can it's great timing <laughs> and i can i can devote myself more to mary Mm -hmm. um and become closer to her too and so yeah my life definitely took like a huge 180 yeah i mean uh, it, for in a, so. in a fabulous way i mean because the, the state that you're yeah. in now i mean it's obviously yes you're gonna have um bad days and some hurdles but but it's good it, it's objectively good um yeah. i do want to ask you, you a question about something before we wrap up um I don't personally think that a person should be able to agree to the sort of medical uh, interventions that you went through. Like I know that a lot of people, especially on the right, will say, well, kids shouldn't be able to agree to it. And that's true. Yeah. But I also think that an adult shouldn't either, because I think it's, it's like with an amputation. If somebody came and said, I want my right arm chopped off, even though it's perfectly fine. I don't think there's a point at yeah. which we say, well, he's 25, you know, he can make his own decision. I, I don't think that's right because I don't think that, um, I don't think it's, it demonstrates the capacity of reason, you know? Right. No, there's clearly, first of all, gender dysphoria is real, but it's a mental problem. Yeah. You don't, you don't resolve a mental problem or a psychological problem by having radical plastic surgery or having, you know, these incredibly unnatural physical treatments. Um, you can go to you can go to therapy to work it out and i'm not even i'm not even talking about like conversion therapy which i don't even think that's a thing like i've never heard of that like conversion therapy proper but um like you can go to therapy you can like you can take medication you can like do other things to address 
mental problems. Yeah. Um, and there's a way to like be honest with yourself that you have these feelings. Um, but like the answer is not to cut your breasts off. Like it's just not, I mean, I have progressively become more and more um, radicalized <laughs> on this issue. I think when I was first detransitioning, I probably would have said the same thing, like, oh, kids shouldn't be able to do it, but adults can do what they want. But like, my eyes have just been really open to it now that I'm on the other side of it. Yeah. It's like, no adult should be able to do this. I'm sorry. Like, I, I, I just, Lila, are you done? Um, I just, yeah, I agree with you. I don't think anyone should be able to do this. Honestly, I think that it's, it's a symptom of a very, very, very bad idea that we as a society have, has, have just fully accepted and now celebrate. Yeah. Um, and it's just based on nothing really in reality like the studies that have been done on it are really flawed the studies that have been done on it that show that it's bad have been suppressed um so i don't even know i don't know what the future holds yeah um what has been the reaction from the people around you for your i mean you basically flipped as you said you did a 180 uh was yeah. that how was that received well, I'm sure some of my old friends think that I've lost my mind. <laughs> I'm sh I, I, none of them have like confronted me, but I'm sure a lot of them are like, what happened? Like, what are you, you what are you doing? Like, cause I'm, I have a completely different worldview now and it's completely against theirs. But obviously like my family was very happy about it. Okay. Um, I wasn't I wasn't happy about it at first because I was like, oh my gosh, like I've just made this horrible decision and I don't know what the future holds. Um, overall, the response has been very positive. All right, well, thank you for, for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. I mean, you, you're a really powerful uh, witness and it, it's, it's fabulous just to hear how you've come through on the other side with so many just successes, frankly. But I will let you go. I know that Lila wants your attention for sure. But uh, but thank yeah. you for coming on. How should uh, people find you and follow you in the future? Is there an ideal way? Um, I'm probably most active on X. Mm -hmm. um, my username is Daisy is not here. It's a it's an old account that I made when I was like in eighth grade. So that was my that was my username then, and that's my username now. Um, but yeah, just search my name. You'll find me on X. Um, I have an Instagram where I'm less active. I don't talk about the gender stuff as much there, but that's, you know, same thing. Just search my name. My username's DM strong in on that. So All right. if you want my gender rantings, go to X. <laughs> okay. All right. Certainly. Well, thank you again. And I'll, I hope to, to maybe, you know, get you back on the show at some point in the future, but this was, this was phenomenal. So thank you. Yeah, this was great. Thank you so much for having me. All right, bye. Hey, you're still here. Don't forget to give the video a like. Subscribe if you haven't already and share it with your friends. I've also got links in the description as to how you can help support my work. Thank you so much.